Super. So, uh, welcome everyone to um, episode 39. And we are we're delighted to, to welcome Dr. Dylan Morrissey. He's a, for those of you who don't know him, um, many hats, consultant, physiotherapist, uh, academic, researcher, just an absolute um, uh, complete whiz with all the, the research papers on, on, on almost everything I've ever spoken to him about. So we, we, we welcome you, Dylan. We really appreciate your time. Thanks for joining us. And um, our topic of discussion is, is shockwave therapy. So we've had some questions come in, come in over the week that we're going to run through. And anyone watching, feel free to, um, to pitch in and ask questions as we go along. And we'll, we'll, we'll obviously um, ask Dylan to field them as they come in. Um, but we thought we'd start off with the, the I guess, the, the obvious place to start, which is, um, you know, what is, what is Shockwave? Um, what's its proposed mechanism of action? Yeah, well, thanks, Ian and, and Craig. Thanks for arranging this and, and having me along. Uh, congratulations on um, your, your, your uh, series. You're on 39, I understand. Um, so what is this shockwave thing? Um, I asked myself the same question the first time I was told about it, which um, and I obviously didn't get a very convincing answer because I decided it was a lot of nonsense. Uh, this is a long, long time ago. But the research has proven me wrong um, and we've started to include it in clinical practice, and I'm, I'm very glad that we have. But it's a very simple thing. It's a sound wave. It's a high energy pulse, um, given it at various uh, frequencies, um, depending on, on your choice. And it delivers energy to the tissues using um, the usual um, sound wave propagation with um, peaks and troughs. Um, and it seems to make tissues do something differently. Uh, it seems to make um, perhaps a pro-inflammatory and a pro-matrix breakdown effect, um, cer almost certainly a pain effect, a positive effect on nociception. Um, and it can be delivered in various ways, as various devices that, that broadly categorized into uh, ones which are radial, so you get a, a peak of uh, energy at the surface, which then spreads. Um, and the benefits of that are that people can feel the highest energy. So it's, it has a sort of perhaps a, a more um, intuitively safe um, uh, profile as opposed to focused where the energy is focused deeper in the tissues where you may not have the, the same degree of sensation. But equally, you can perhaps target the um, tissues more, more directly and with a higher dose. So it's, it's uh, and it, it comes from, from medical devices, it comes from lithotripsy, so I think as a certain mystique because of that, which is unfortunate, because people regard this as being far more complicated than it is, uh, and that kind of, I think, restricts access a little bit. But it's a simple device and it's a, it's a tool, um, you know, I'm mainly talking to podiatrists, I think, but physiotherapists, uh, sports physicians, anyone who might be using this device, it's an adjunct. Um, and it's, from my perspective as a clinician, uh, fantastic to have something in the locker that will usually give an effect in certain circumstances um, and that we've got pretty good evidence for, which I know we'll be talking about more as we go along. You can't, can I just ask, how, how clear or succinct is the evidence on the mechanism of action? Uh, it's, it's, it's got a long way to go. Yeah, it's that's, that's what I thought. <laughs> yeah. And we've dabbled in this area, um, but whether you're talking about the exact waveform or the mode of application or um, the dose, which I know we're going to come back to, um, or the intensity within a sort of a time dose or the number of sessions, we I, I, I'm not comfortable saying that we know the mechanism of action. We've got some good hints. Um, and, you know, the ideal world, you would know all the mechanisms and then you'd work out the best way to apply it to get the optimum effects. We're kind of doing a bit of both with maybe a little bit more focus on effects for different conditions and different situations um, and working out the mechanisms later. Yeah. So I know when I'm talking about the different interventions for plantar fasciitis, I often say, look, you've got, a, you've got some degeneration in the tissue here, maybe some inflammatory cells. So think about what your intervention might do to that. And if you think about, well, what would shockwave do to that degeneration? And I know in lay terms, a lot of clinicians are saying it induces an inflammation in that degeneration, and that's what facilitates healing. 
But yeah. I think from what you're saying, that the evidence is not exactly clear. It could easily be a nocebic type um, mechanism and nothing to do with affecting that degeneration in the tissue. <clears throat> I, I, um, I, I doubt it's not doing anything to the, mm. to the tissue. Um, you know, we, uh, what I'm saying is we're not 100% clear. Mm. But uh, so we did, we did a study um, which we've just, we just submitted the um, second paper from where we, some very clever colleagues of mine did it really. I, I helped and I was even a, uh, a victim for it where we took people with Achilles and patella tendinopathy and um, put a, a needle deep to the tendon um, for the Achilles and alongside the tendon for the patella and a little microdialysis um, tube. So that can sample the, the tissue environment around the tendon. Um, it's a bit of a chunky needle and a chunky thing and then you have to sit there for a long time and you're not allowed to go to the bathroom. Um, so it's a bit of an onerous study to do. Um, but you run a bit of solution through and you sample every now and again and you can see what is happening in terms of the, um, the tissue environment. Um, and that was, that was a really useful study and that's where we showed definite pro-inflammatory effects. Various interleukins were upregulated and so on and definite matrix breakdown effects. Um, so various MMPs and so on were, were upregulated. And we're now looking at the proteome to, to see if there was protein changes. And we, we are seeing some differences. We did that in a range of healthy people and people with tendinopathy, but it's one dose. And even though it was a, a long time doing the study uh, for the individual, it was just within a day. So we're, and when we see the clinical effects is, you know, three months down the line, it seems to be the sort of peak of the clinical effects, I think. Um, so it's maybe kick-starting something that then enables the body to move forward or enables rehab to work or enables an orthotic to have an effect or someone's activity levels to change, something like that. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense. That's how I've tried to explain it to patients in layman's terms as, as, as to its mechanism. But we have had two comments on the mechanism. One, a question from Robert. Um, he's asked... Is there an element of disrupting collagen cross linkages with shockwave therapy? Oh gosh. <laughs> um, uh, possibly, yes. Yes. So if we're looking at matrix metallic proteinases, we're looking at matrix change, then yes, we are affecting structure. Um, the degree to which that is the case, I don't know. And what makes me nervous about this is um, when I was when I was first studying um, ultrasound um, and, and that's a, as a therapeutic modality there was very clear effects on tissues if you took a bit of tissue in a petri dish and, and some fantastic researchers um, showing incredible differences but when that was then used in a patient um, with all the things that happen with a patient all the psychosocial factors all the you know, ticking a tissue in, in the context of a whole body, it, it didn't seem to have much of a therapeutic effect. So that's what made me nervous about shockwave in the early days. People say, hey, look, I've got this amazing device. And I, I just saw it as, a, as, a, as a, a variation on, which we'd seen various variations on therapeutic ultrasound before it became sort of much less used. Mm. Um, yeah, yeah. No, thank, thanks, Dylan. Now, the other question we had on um, mechanism coming from Rev, is it true that shockwave kills off the C fibers and after six months, half of them grow back? Well, there does seem to be a denervation um, element. I don't know about them growing back at six months. These things are difficult to measure. And, and look, um, the end organs for these small nociceptors are easily differentiated and do different things in different circumstances. What we definitely see is differences in terms of pain. Now, that, whether that's because a tissue is in better state and there's less nociceptive stimulus or whether that's a denervation thing, I think that's a really important question to know because I'm slightly nervous about denervating tissues, unless it's on a little bit. Um, you'd much rather that a tissue was, was in a better state and there was less of a chemical nociceptive stimulus. Um, but what we do see from, from a, whole, a large range of studies actually now, um, of varying quality, but increasingly there are, is an accumulation of high quality papers who see definite pain effects fairly early on that are maintained, as I said, particularly into the medium term.
and they're probably reflecting some immediate tissue change, I suspect. I hope that answers Ralph's question. Yeah, that make, makes sense, yeah. Yeah, no, it makes sense, yeah. Good. Ian? Perfect. <clears throat> so, inevitably, we're going to get on to talk about the research and, and, it, and its, its findings, its conclusions, and, and go from there. But before we do, um, can we talk about the research itself and how it's designed, its methodology yeah. and things? We, we, yeah. we have this exact same discussion and debate in the world of foot orthoses um, in that you, you take a conclusion, but you've got to look at it in, in the context of, of the study design. Um, question came in, which I think is a fairly good one, which is you know, when they are looking at experimental groups in, in shockwave um, research and control groups, what's the control group getting and, and and you know because the example that was given is if you were doing a therapeutic ultrasound study you'd, you'd hold the probe on both people in both groups and then and you just turn the machine on in one of them and not in the other no one would really know but with shockwave that feels a bit difficult to mask so what's the current um state of play with uh, how, how do you mask people knowing what group they're in and, and what are the limitations there yeah so this is a really important question um and I'm going to get slightly philosophical here in terms of philosophy, uh, philosophy of ethics, um, because in trial design, a true placebo or a wait and see or a sham treatment is, is quite a difficult thing to decide to do. And it's really critical. And of course, we're all treating patients with interventions that maybe weren't developed from evidence initially. They develop from experience and from a bit of a, a suck it and see approach, obviously a bit more than that, based on theory and, and so on. So we've got established interventions that we think are effective. So if something new comes along, um, or relatively new, then the temptation is to compare that to current care. And there's a good ethical background, there's a good ethical reason to do that. The difficulty is current care may not be evidence-based may not truly be evidence-based. We know that for all sorts of um, conditions. So you're absolutely right. We should be comparing treatments to placebo unless we've got an initial proven treatment. So what's a good placebo? And this has been done. Um, and there's a really tricky trial if you want to look at it, um, comparing placebo versus mock placebo for shockwave that is a bit of a head bender. I won't go there. Uh, but... What can we use as a comparator? Well, there's, there's devices that can, can um, effectively block the shock waves. So there's pads that are used to block the shock waves, which are pretty um, effective. What's not, not acceptable is a really low dose. Um, and I think that's not acceptable for all sorts of reasons, because if you've got a, often a lot of trials are using a low to moderate dose actually. Um, and if you then give a, a tiny dose as a comparison, you're still giving a dose. And who knows, maybe, maybe the tiny dose is enough just to change something so that you lose a treatment effect. Um, so I, th I think it's a bit like the orthotics and, and sham orthoses. You know, if you use, uh, you know, a, whether it's a custom or a prefab or a, or a contoured shoe, as a, an intervention and you compare that to something, that something has got to be as inert as possible. So, uh, you know, a three millimeter sorbethane uncontoured insole is probably good enough as a, as a sham, I would have thought, or as a placebo. Um, but some people would argue, well, you're, you're changing the mechanics with that three millimeters. Yeah. It's not easy. But I think that we've got to be careful on another level which is that what we do um, is multifaceted complex interventions that involve a therapeutic alliance, a partnership, you know, education, um, multiple interventions that are timed in particular ways. And that's really hard and really to research and it's really valuable. It's probably the most important bit. Um, and people get very excited about something like shockwave because you can easily identify this box and the, the 4.2 minutes of treatment and the two and a half thousand shocks and you can you can control it a bit like a drug um, you know you can easily see a tablet and make another one that's inert 
and therefore maybe we over research these things because they're easy. We mustn't lose sight of the, the difficult stuff, which is probably where the highest value is, which is that interaction and the multifaceted intervention. As a long answer to a short question, yes, I think we've got decent placebo stroke sham, stroke wait and see, and we don't need to do any more of them because the studies are done for, for most of those studies. We know there's essentially reasonable efficacy, if not effectiveness, for, um, for things like plantar heel pain or plantar fasciitis or whatever you want to call it, for mid-portion Achilles tendinopathy, for insertional tendinopathy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dylan, mo most of the studies I seem to recall reading recently on shockwave for plantar heel pain, they never really had a control group. They were comparing them to injection therapy or something else, um, in, in which case all, all groups seem to get better. <laughs> uh, or not, as the case. <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah. Um, so so um, I'll share some, some work which is um, coming up, which Ian's involved in, and we're very close to to finally finishing, it's been, it's been hard work. Uh, we, we plan to do a systematic review of systematic reviews for um, plantar heel pain, irrespective of intervention, to look at every intervention, because I think plantar heel pain A is common, B is problematic, and C, we don't have really good answers for it yet. Not in the, not in the research, anyway. And I saw all these systematic reviews out there, and I've done this before for uh, patellofemoral pain, and we thought, let's go after a systematic review of systematic reviews. And we started to do this, and we quickly realized we couldn't because the standards of the systematic reviews were so variable. Some cracking systematic reviews, some really quite um, lesser quality ones. So we went back to, we've gone back to the source studies, which means we're dealing with literally um, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of randomized control trials. So we've cut out everything which doesn't have high quality, doesn't have a very low risk of bias, and doesn't um, have a, essentially a, a reasonable sample size. We've still got a big chunk of studies to deal with. And going back to what I said earlier about how we do these comparisons, um, we've then taken out every study where there's a comparison to true placebo or sham or wait and see. And that's where we get the primary efficacy from. And there is enough from, in shockwave studies of comparisons, particularly in the German or sort of middle European literature, um, big studies, pretty well done actually, pretty high quality, low risk of bias, where there is a placebo, um, thankfully. Mm. I'm doing something for Achilles tendinopathy at the same time. And actually, a lot of my preconceptions about progressive loading or eccentric loading um, only just make it through because there isn't the same size and volume and quality of studies comparing progressive load to to a sham or to placebo because it's so difficult to do right yeah. uh, and it just and people haven't actually really tried so we're so in terms of comparison to placebo what you've got is or or you with the ICTs you've got a huge amount of noise there is a lot of really poor quality trials out there. People try hard, but they're just not good enough. But if you filter out the lower quality and, and filter out the high quality, we do have enough, it's exciting. We do have enough to concrete, concrete recommendations. Yeah. Soon. Sounds good. <laughs> so apology to Ian, because I've, I've taken, I've, I haven't taken my time over this. It's just, it's taken a long time, but it's, we're close to it. Sending you some stuff to, uh, to 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 trash as you see fit to, to pull it apart. Uh, it's looking it's looking interesting. Yeah, actually, Robert's just made another comment. Yeah, uh, analysis of the meta analyses next level, <laughs> which is yeah. Yeah, yeah. So we're not we're not Sorry. doing a huge amount of meta analysis in this. There's network meta analyses, which are complicated yeah. pieces, and. Uh, Again, I think they've got real strengths, but the risk is that if you lob in every comparison, you, you don't have a, a, a foundation. You don't have um, almost a baseline of, okay, this is, this is true placebo. So one of the trials that we debated at length, for example, this will appeal to podiatrists, I suspect, um, 
was a, a really well done study from a group who I admire hugely and do are doing fabulous work in the musculoskeletal field. They're a prolific group, um, and they compared various they compared orthotics, contoured sandals, and what you guys would call thongs. We call flip flops. <laughs> But of course, as, as my first patient in clinic this afternoon said, her plantar heel pain had been a lot worse this summer because she'd been wearing flip-flops the whole time. And so are flip-flops a, a suitable sham or placebo or, um, you know, inert intervention? No, they're not because they're potentially making people worse. So any effect that you see of the, the, the key intervention of interest uh, whether it's the contoured sandals or, or whatever, the, 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 the insoles, the orthoses, could actually, if you see any difference, it could be, of course, that the, the, the poorly supported footwear is, is making some, some people a bit worse. So that's where we just we need to get those placebo-controlled trials right first off, and then we can go from there. Once we've got an event, intervention that's been shown to be effective, we can then compare other things like that. And if it's a true non-inferiority trial and they get the same results, it's the other one's effective too. But if you're comparing unknown with unknown, then you still don't know it. Yeah. Can we, Dylan, can we talk, <coughs> excuse me, can we talk about the paper you, you, uh, you and your team published in 2015 in the American Journal of Sports Medicine? Uh, it was uh, another systematic review on shockwave for uh, lower limb tendon tendinopathies um yeah lovely lovely paper and and, and it its conclusion uh, i'm paraphrasing and looking down at my notes is that shockwave is effective and should be considered for um achilles tendinopathy both insertional and mid portion and patella tendinopathy um Having looked uh, across and done a bit of research on other sort of systematic reviews, they're the, they're, they seem to be the two, particularly the Achilles, that, 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 that seems to be well supported for, for considering shockwave for. And then, of course, plant, plantar, plantar heel pain, plantar fascia, um, fasciosis, fasciopathy, or whatever you want to call it as well. Uh, I mean, that was two years ago, three years ago now. Uh, do, your gut feeling is, if you redid that today, would that be the same results? Is there anything, anything no, else no. missing around there that um, conducive no, to the think... perineal tendons, tip, tip post? Uh, oh, I wish. Um, no, no. Uh, I think we might pull back a bit on the patella tendinopathy because that was very tentative in the AJSM paper and there's been a, a nice study since which didn't show effects and the patella tendon is quite a different tendon in lots of ways it's often called the patella ligament right um so we might roll back a bit on the patella tendinopathy uh insertional in achilles mid portion achilles and plantar fascia um i don't see any reason to roll back on that in fact um there's been some some more work that reinforces reinforces that um and look you, you say it's a 2015 uh, systematic review. It's not. It's really a 2014 because by the time these things are published um, and take the peer review process and then there's when the search was done. It, I can't remember when the search was for that, but it would be. So it was a, a good time before and there's an explosion of work at the moment um, that's, that's, that's going on at present. Um, so there's a, a further review you could look at in BJSM um, which is a network meta-analysis which will tell you a little bit more but you just got to be a bit careful because again often reviews will include a lot of a lot of different trial designs and I've done that myself many times in the past quite deliberately where you don't have much evidence you've got to make the best of what you've got um, but I think where we are now we can be much more choosy which is a good place to be. <laughs> So not, not many other sort of pathologies around the foot and ankle outside of the Achilles and the plantar heel pain okay. that, that, that you'd, you'd sort of lean towards shockwave for? Um, if you're trying to be very evidence-based, um, then, and you're saying, well, so the, the approach I take with these things, if something's been shown not to work against placebo, then you shouldn't use it except in a trial. So for example, PRP for um, Achilles tendinopathy has been shown not to work 
Um, and therefore, I don't think it should be used except in a clinical trial. Um, if something has not been looked at in a proper RCT, um, then you're justified in using it in particular circumstances if things with proven effects haven't been shown to work. And long flexors, perineal tendons, for most people, and this is maybe an opportunity for podiatrists particularly, for most people they see so few of these um, that doing clinical trials is just incredibly difficult. You know, I see a lot of um, tendinopathy. I see a lot of foot and ankle tendinopathy. I don't see much, I, you know, pure long flex or perineal tendon um, stuff. In a clinic I used to work in, which was a, a diagnostic clinic, we saw a fair bit. But even that was a couple of cases a week out of maybe 40 or 50. Um, so hard things to look at. But, you know, we, we've now recruited 155 patients to our Achilles tendinopathy trial, which includes shockwave high volume injection and rehab. Um, and that's been hard work. You'd think it'd be easy. It's been hard work. Um, Actually, just so, on, oh, sorry, just, just on that treating other conditions, we, a, a few episodes ago, we looked at calcaneal apophysitis, Sever's disease. Yeah. And the comment come out about a patient being treated with shockwave for that. And I, Ooh. apparently the highlight of that video was the look of horror on my face as that comment was made. But yeah. I've just been looking for the video, but I can't find it. So I just Googled Sever's disease and shockwave therapy. Um, yeah. There are quite a few clinics offering it. So <laughs> there is, um, there's, a, there's a whole, we don't, we don't do it. You know, we run an, uh, I run an interprofessional um, NHS-based sports medicine clinic. We have a fantastic podiatrist, so you'll all know, um, and sports physicians, rheumatologists, physios, um, all working together. We have a shockwave clinic within that. Uh, we have the ultrasound there and all that kind of stuff. Um, and one of the areas that people are often suggesting might be suitable for shockwave is bone pain. So whether it's stress fracture, sesamoiditis, um, no one's ever asked us to do this on severs. Um, I think that's that's uh, very, very risky because you're dealing with a, a growing situation. Mm -hmm. You know, you're dealing with someone who's, who's in a very active growth phase you just don't know what you're doing um so i would regard that as being being um unwise i would have thought mm. uh, not without evidence and look our duty of care and our level of um caution is much higher in certain certain groups at certain times of life so we don't treat people who are pregnant there's no obvious reason why not why can't you treat somebody's foot and someone who's pregnant? We don't because we don't know. And, and this is, you know, it's one of the rules with clinical trials that we're sort of taking into our clinical practice. If, if in doubt, don't do it when someone is pregnant because the ramifications are so, are so high. I would have thought an athlete with severs, we've got plenty of things which work. Um, yeah, that's the... This, this, is, this is not the way to go, I wouldn't have thought. Yeah, no, I was just I was just surprised when I just Googled Severs and Shockwave, you know, it says here, radial shockwave therapy may afford some pain relief. And this comment here, ESWT are sound waves channeled into the heel for one to two minutes to vibrate the bone and increase the bone density of the heel. And that's under Severs disease at a sports injury clinic in London. <laughs> uh, not ours. Um, <laughs> yes. yes. Oh, I think that, 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 that gives me the slight heebie-jeebies. But look, um, and heebie-jeebies is Scottish for it. That, um, for, for, <laughs> don't don't want to go there. It gives me the fear. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. No, I, I'm, I, am aware, I am aware of a few... Sorry. Go on, go on. Yeah, it's just I am aware of a couple of studies on metatibial stress syndrome using it, but I, from memory, the, the, the quality wasn't that good. But Robert Isaacs has just commented again that he actually has used shockwave on his own metatibial stress syndrome and it worked like a treat. <laughs> oh, well, that's good. And, and FPSS, one can get quite desperate for these patients and they have increasingly um, obscure or, you know, lower likely return of positive intervention um, effects. You know, people doing all sorts of um, injection therapies and stripping and all that kind of stuff. And I completely understand why, because if you've tried all the things that should work and they don't work, and you've still got this athlete who cannot 
do what they need to be able to do to perform or you've got someone whose everyday life is very disrupted by something like MTSS then you know you are justified in trying slightly weird and wonderful things I've tried it for MTSS I can't say I've ever had um, what I would call a sort of a, a satisfactory therapeutic effect um, but equally I'm doing it for people where everything else has failed so maybe it is a situation where nothing's going to work. Um, so um, the, the other is recalcitrant stress fractures, but again, we've got other ways of dealing with those. So um, I, I'm, I think the jury is out on bone pain. Certainly the standard of studies is poor. Yes. Um, this is a good time to bring up this comment because we've sort of segued from the research world into kind of the real world the clinical practice now which I think is where we want to be for sure um, at this part of the discussion and a question came in talking about the timing of when we should use shock waves so clearly when even for let's say an Achilles an Achilles tendinopathy where the evidence for shock wave is very good um, should we be doing it the first time it comes into our clinic should we be exhausting usual conservative or you know usual but you know loading protocols do they run concurrently? Is it done on the chronicity uh, of, of the problem? Um, and we know there was a paper in um, uh, 2013 that talked about uh, shockwave being great for Achilles, but if you combined it with eccentric loading, there was an even more superior effect. So bring us into the real world, if, if, if you can, Dylan, and talk to us about the, the, the timing of the delivery of this, if that's okay. In, in, in research is the real world. <laughs> well, sorry, sorry. But yeah, our real world. <laughs> the wet lab, maybe not. But um, the clinical trial world, um, this is the question. This is one of the questions we use when we're interviewing the research physios is the difference between innovation and practice in a research study. And really, it's mainly the oversight. It's not the delivery. Um, but, but it's a really good question to, to ask because that's exactly what we're looking at in our clinical trial is what typically what happens and this has nothing to do with evidence and it's nothing to do with clinical reasoning really it's got to do with resources typically what happens is people wait until everything else is not working before they bring out the slightly um, more expensive or dramatic treatment I think that's a, a kind of a a fact of the way it's been introduced and evolved in clinical practice no more than that so our clinical trial for Achilles tendinopathy, for example, is looking at what happens if we do this early in the pathway. Start someone on progressive loading that we know should work and then pretty quickly add something like shockwave or high volume injection and see if we get a better effect from the combination compared to one on its own. Um, so sticking in the real world of research, if, if we were just to look at the effect sizes from... from uh, systematic reviews for plantar heel pain and Achilles tendinopathy, we would start with shockwave um, because it's probably got the best effect sizes um, and most robust research. Doesn't seem quite right. We're in, 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 our, in our clinical reasoning real world, the evidence-based medicine world, which includes patient preferences, our experience in clinical reasoning and, and the evidence. Um, we know there's certain things we've got to get sorted. We've got to get people on side with etiology, we've got to address things for plantar heel pain like footwear and, and any sort of abusive load. And then we can consider things like whether it's a, an orthosis or, or shockwave, etc. I guess my biggest answer to this question is we've got to junk the, the barriers. We're going to get rid of the barriers to this. Um, interviewing experts from around the world, it was amazing how many people simply don't act, have access, either because of cost or because of some kind of perception that it's a, um, it's out of scope of practice. It's an easy thing to deliver. It's not a big deal. Um, or because of, um, I, or because, yeah, so scope of practice or cost are two big things around availability. Or there's a little bit about, um, some, in some places, legislation. Uh, you know, people are prohibited from doing certain things. We've got to get rid of this. It should just be, and anyone who's seeing decent numbers of the right kinds of patients, it should be sitting in the room and used whenever you think it's appropriate. And that could be very early because, as we talked earlier, there's a nice uh, question from, from uh, one of your um, listeners that Craig talked about, you know, the effects on pain. 
if you've got something that's acutely painful and you can get the pain down, you might want to use it very early on to facilitate other in interventions and to just get them into a better place to start. If you've got someone who's really struggling um, to get that last bit, maybe that's a good place to give it a good old zap um, just to try and get them over the, the last bit if they've plateaued. And that's something that we should be free to, to reason for if given patient. Yeah, it's, um, it's an interesting, Dylan, because I just recently recall reading um, a, a critique of neo-A management by GPs. And when I was reading this, I kept thinking about plantar heel pain. But what the critique was, was that tip, the typical, say, GP managed for knee pain is to try this. Oh, it didn't work. Let's try this. Oh, it didn't work. Let's try this. You know, it's sort of, it's just like jumping from one, one modality to the next. And I, I just see that is one of the big problems in plantar heel pain. <laughs> there is, it's the timing of different interventions, all that kind of, you know, the issues that you, that you were just talking about. Yeah. And, and one of the big gaps in the research, which I think is an exciting gap and was highlighted by um, the ACE experts, is what we should be looking at is combined treatments. Yeah. If we haven't, you know, I, closely identifying which patients and then having packages of interventions that work for that yeah. type of presentation. You know, and the, you know, the athletic patient with acute pain is very different to the... 60 year old who's a shop worker and and um is maybe overweight and not doing enough activity you know there's very different people and you know this person may have had it for five years and tried everything it's a very different situation yes yeah, like um, some it's like some of those recent studies in patellofemoral pain that have attempted to subgroup people with the yeah. hi, with the hypothesis that different subgroups have different risk factors and respond differently to different interventions we're not even close to doing that for heel pain I don't think we're that we're not we're not there with plantar uh, patellofemoral pain with PFP yet. Um, we don't, yeah, we, we haven't really. Started. Well, there've been there've been attempts to do it. There's, I think a couple of studies have looked at it, tried to look at that subgrouping. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, it's a start, and I've watched that work evolve, um, and it's really impressive work. Hmm. But um, it's, uh, I think the struggles they've had to do that show how difficult it is. I think they're quite close. But now the, now the sort of trials that show differential effects of interventions are needed. You know, we see, we have some work done on outcome predictors, which is a really difficult area that I think will become incredibly um, productive fairly soon through artificial intelligence. That's another story. Um, but so the subgrouping that we've done is a bit clumsy up until now. Yeah. It could become much more subtle and much more useful in future. Um, that makes sense. Oh, you got anything there, Ian? Or? Um, I have, yeah, yeah. One of the questions that, that was inevitable uh, also, uh, we touched on a few of these, were the contraindications. So when we, when we shouldn't do it, I know we just, just recently you said you don't do it in, in uh, those who are pregnant, and we talked a bit about sort yeah. of the, sy the symptomatic growth plates. Anything else that should be a, a no-go? Either, either supported by data or just, just intuitively? I think, I think open wounds, infection, suspicion of a, any kind of uh, neoplastic disease, um, unless someone is absolutely clear. Um, all of those sorts of things are, are pretty standard. Um, people have been on long-term anticoagulants and so on. Um, there's, there's lots of theoretical risks with those. Um, the difficult one, and, and this is the, the tricky one, is what do you do with someone with a small tear of a tissue? You know, a small plantar fascia tear or a small, you know, Achilles tendon tear that's maybe quite old and somewhat healed. And in theory, um, that should either be a contraindication or a caution. Um, but I've seen these people treated and we've made conscious decisions with a couple of people to treat um, and they've done very well because these small tears are very difficult to differentiate actually just from a, an area, a grossly degenerative area, and probably have a very similar pain mechanism. So an acute tear, no, um, but maybe some of these chronic tears is where you've got to exercise some judgment and maybe test the waters a little bit first. Certainly at the moment we scan them all and if they've got tear and it's initial part of treatment, then we don't, we don't treat them with shockwave. But with some of the more chronic things that are not getting better than with how you'd normally manage a tear, then it's, then it's potentially an option. 
Uh, you, you mentioned scanning there, Dylan. Talking about uh, cl clinical outcomes, not research, the research world, but the clinical world now, both real world, of course. Um, <laughs> do you, is your main outcome measure pain or do you often scan sort of pre and post and you're looking for sort of tissue changes or a combination of the two? No, it's got to be um, patient reported outcomes uh, of some kind. Uh, we use region specific proms. Um, we could use something like a, you know, a single, are you better enough? But ultrasound, ultrasound changes don't pretty much aren't a useful indicator of tissue change. Similarly, MRI, you know, if you look at osteochondral bone bruises, um, the clinical course doesn't match the imaging course. The ultrasound is useful for excluding some things and giving you a sort of picture of what it's like at onset, but you can't expect you know, the tissue thickness, etc., necessarily to change a lot. Some studies show this, um, and but I wouldn't, I wouldn't regard that as a hard sign. You know, at the end of the day, if the patient's pain and function is improved, that's what we're after. If their tissue still happens to be chunky and 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 have some disorganisation, but it's doing what they need them to do and it's got the capacity, that's fine. Yeah, but. Um, and last question was under the under the sort of subheading of risks. Um, uh, how, how best how best to word this? Sometimes someone will come to clinic and they'll demand a pair of foot orthoses from the podiatrist. That's what they've decided, and they walk in the door. That's what they need because a friend or a colleague or Google told them so. And there's there's enough flags of varying colours that you sort of make a decision that this probably, this may not be a, a sensible relationship to embark upon. Mm -hmm. If that's, if you, if you found any similarities in the, in the world of Shockwave? No, not really. Um, although it's a big shiny machine and it makes a clicky noise and, you know, it's got a bit of mystique. Um, but, uh, you know, we talked about this a little bit earlier. In the, the difficulty, if you've got a patient who's fixating on something, there's a reason they're fixating and it's probably not the something it's it's another background reason and, and what we've got to do is to try and just unpick that a little bit within our scope and and get that patient to the right service or right place in the right way can we promote dependence yes we can um, and we've definitely got to be careful not to do that but if someone's already in a situation where they're um, very dependent on something then trying to address the reasons for why they're looking to, to be dependent is important and if it wasn't shockwave or orthosis or something it would be something else i think that's quite different from someone who has a clear sort of idea that something will help them um as long as they're not uh, their expectations aren't completely um misplaced or out of proportion then actually Meeting someone's expectations means your treatment is more likely to work. So, you know, if someone comes in and thinks, this is what I really need, and there's no reason not to give them it, then you're likely to get a better effect. You know, expectation is a powerful, a powerful part of a, a recovery mechanism. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so, we, you know, there are, those, there are those patients who are very susceptible, and there's usually, you usually find, when you dig in the history, I, I find, particularly with open questions, you find there's all sorts of um, other mismanaged conditions ongoing at the same time and, and in the history uh, that, that, that show that there's a strong need for sort of psychological therapies of some kind. And, and do patients have quite high expectations generally because of the shiny big machine that they may have read about in, in in the media, are expectations quite high? Are they pretty, pretty, pretty level generally? I think expectations are high. And uh, the, the, the main group that I see in our shockwave clinic is um, quite chronic and have often quite a lot of failed interventions. Um, and there's two reasons it's high. One is that they're coming to a new clinic, so that, you know, hope is renewed. And I think the other is we've had very good results and we haven't shouted about them, but, but clinicians know, referrers know. So referrers are saying to patients, you know, go and have this done, this is likely to help. And this is one of the key things, whether it's a GP or a fellow professional, 
um, or a, you know, a, someone else in the NDT, the way they refer to a given service or the way that you refer to a service and the, the importance you put on it and the, and the emphasis that you give it and the, almost the sell, you know, this is likely to help you, it, um, has a big effect on how someone arrives. If someone is referred for a particular intervention, say, oh, you could try this, it might work, then patient expectations and, and likelihood of success, I think, are somewhat less than, you know, I, someone who refers and says, well, I'm pretty sure this is what you need. This is how it works. It should, I've seen really good results with other patients. You should definitely do this. It gives a very different message to me. So hopefully positive expectations are coming with their, partly their expectations, partly what they've got from whoever sent them along. Um, that is my list of questions on my bit of paper all gone through, Craig. Anything else on yeah. the... Well, nice. I think the only comment I had, and we, we just touched on this before we went live, was the, the whole issue of dosing. And what, what brought it to my attention was the whole concept that people have been started to talk about recently about foot orthotic dosing. You know, did the clinical trial use the foot orthotics at an appropriate clinical dose? And the analogy I like to use is um, hypertensive drugs. So there's a clinical trial done on a very low dose of an antihypertensive, and it was a very well done study. And then it showed the drug didn't work at that very low dose. Should that study be included in the meta-analyses and systematic reviews of that drug? Because it will bias the, that review in the direction of that drug not working. But it was at a low dose. And I, I, I do recall a very early study on shockwave therapy for plantar heel pain that I thought was really well done. And, and I know a number of clinicians at the time screaming out that this study is fatally flawed. And I'd look at it and I couldn't work out what was wrong with it but it used the shockwave at a very low dose. So from my recollection, I think the early systematic reviews on shockwave therapy for heel pain concluded it wasn't that effective, probably because it was biased in the direction of these low dose studies. So I just wonder if you'd comment on that. <laughs> yeah, and, and those responses is, is a key thing to work out. Um, so having seen positive effects from studies, which are typically using a protocol that um, sometimes called the Gerdesmeyer protocol of three doses a week or so apart, um, about four minutes at 10 hertz um, of a dose that a patient can tolerate um, but is a bit painful, so mild to moderate pain. That's the typical protocol and it's looked at quite a lot. Um, you know, having seen that, that that's effective for, for some conditions, we now need to know is a higher dose either within the session more effective or a higher, or, or more treatments um, important to do? And, and it's difficult because we're seeing people, we're auditing people at three months and if they come back and they're still pretty good um, or they've got what they need, then that's easy. But if they're improved, often they want more of it. And you kind of wonder, maybe there's something about that patient, I should have done six treatments or, or taken the dose up even higher to, uh, to a sort of barely tolerable dose. Um, so th these are important, really, really important questions. Um, I kind of have a feeling that, you know, we're seeing good effects with what we're doing. I kind of have a feeling that slight, a couple more sessions for some patients would be beneficial. But, you know, it's, it's a pretty straightforward research question to do. I haven't looked at the trials in progress, but I'd be very surprised if someone wasn't doing it, um, given, given where we are with it. Um, and in answer to the meta-analysis question, you know, that's one of the features of a good meta-analysis is that you don't compare, combine apples and pears. So, you know, um, there's enough drug trials out there. They're way ahead of us in terms of oh, yeah. RCT. That they'll be doing meta-analyses that compare different, dosages and seeing, you know, that's, that's how they can see what works well. Yeah. I, th I think my fear is that, you know, certain intervention may be advised against, against in some consensus guidelines, whereas yeah. the dosing question hasn't been resolved. And if that's resolved, it might actually be a very, very good intervention. Yes. Yeah, consensus yeah. guidelines based on the meta analyses. I mean, just yesterday here in the news media in Australia, uh, there was some publicity given to the NEOA guidelines and what doesn't work and insoles was in, in there. And I think the RCTs tend to do support that. But I also know a lot of work's been done 
on dosing of lateral wedging and affecting neo a so you know, so here we now have an intervention being recommended against where i don 't think the, the we, we know the answer yet because of that dosing question right okay yeah yeah um, well that, that sounds entirely reasonable and I, I know this the shockwave study that you 're referring to yeah. a beautifully conducted study oh yeah, it was uh, yeah it ticks all the boxes in terms of bias and quality of doing the study, but perhaps because it was so early on, like you say, it's quite a low dose. But the other thing is it doesn't have a sham. So it's comparing a, a low dose to a very low dose. Um, so you, what you may be seeing is no difference because um, the, the very low dose maybe has a bit of effect as well. You know, the, we can't expect a linear relationship between dose and effect. What we typically see is a sort of U-shaped curve um, hopefully that you know you get maximum return for applying the intervention in the first place and then maybe diminishing returns as you up the dose until you're overdosing that's a common dose response curve um, so we need to find the effects of that curve and it may be different for different people yeah as you're just interested in the comment you made quite a bit earlier on about doing or attempting to do a systematic review of the systematic reviews um, it'd be interesting if say all those systematic reviews you wanted to review were, were sound enough to do the review, to mm. track them through time for changes in their conclusions. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, because I, I've, I've seen that done, I, I think in a, in a, in aspirin and prevention, prevention of um, cardiac problems. And it was just interesting how they, they, they track them through time yeah. and at a certain time period, yes, the, the zero line was crossed, it's strong enough, but it took another 10 years before the standard textbooks changed to reflect that. So yeah, it was you know, most interesting. Um, I think we're going to be in a very different place in terms of evidence in 10 years. Oh yeah. Uh, because electronic records, um, rapid publication and um, artificial intelligence working in everyday practice should mean that if a new study of uh, sufficient quality comes out to change review findings that should be immediately available to everybody that's that's what uh, something we're working on and i think it's entirely feasible we've got huge delays between uh, um evidence pu publication and and implementation uh, we've got huge problems with access even though you know the internet is everything so available um but we've got a bigger problem in that we're making millions of decisions about patients about which we either don't share the, the results or we get no feedback. So um, I think AI and electronic records will change this beyond all recognition. Yeah, sure. But that's, 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 that's a future one. Yeah. Actually, I, I think one, one place to maybe wind up on is, I don't know whether you caught this study um, last week uh, for different treatment modalities for chronic plantar fasciitis, a 36-month follow-up. Yes. Um, and the four groups were shockwave, platelet-rich plasma, corticosteroid, and prolotherapy. But just just scanning the abstract of the study, what I find interesting, it really illustrates the points you've talked, we've mentioned. But a couple of more interesting points was at the 36-month follow-up, uh, they were the same as what they were baseline. <laughs> Which <laughs> um, are same as baseline. Well, no, hang on. At the end of follow here, yeah, at the end of follow up period, the mean visual analog pain score for all four groups was similar to the mean before treatment. So yeah. at, at three years, none of them had actually made any difference. But it raises that issue just using one intervention, you know, like who um, who just used shockwave on its own. But again, I, I have this job. I mean, you got four groups. It's probably a bit problematic to start with. But the other interesting point was that. Corticosteroids gave the biggest relief in the shortest amount of time. Shockwave therapy was the more effective in the first six months. Yeah. Whereas the prolotherapy and the platelet rich plasma wasn't, the effect wasn't seen for three to 12 months. But again, I, 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 yeah. I, I, who manages plant fests that way anyway? Um, so yeah, I just thought it was a, you know, in the context of what we've been talking about, that study brings up a lot of the issues that we've just gone through. <laughs> yeah. And I, I don't think we should be looking at single studies anymore for, for making evidence decisions, because if you put that in context, I mean, great, great thing to do to do that long term follow up and very yeah. difficult to do. Um, but the, the 
the control and the rigor to deliver that is incredibly difficult. Oh. Um, done, done with the, the right degree of control, that's a, that's a two million pound study. Um, yeah. I suspect you'll, you'll find yeah. perhaps it, was a, um, yeah. it gives us some indications, but we should, we should be careful. Yeah. Well, so maybe one last question. Just say you're in your clinical practice, a, a average plantar fasciitis comes in. What would your protocol be? So um, I wish I could screen share a little infographic. I think there's a, an education package and clearly there's a big assessment component to identify which bits you think are component, uh, do, co contributing to their um, problem so you can address the individual components. Um, big education thing, maybe some stuff around stretching. There's some moderate quality evidence for that. Um, definitely some stuff around footwear advice and load management advice. Mm -hmm. um, I think possibly um, Shockwave is an early intervention, providing it's, it's shown to be safe. Um, for example, with an ultrasound for, for that person. Um, that's probably where I would start. And then it depends on that patient. Custom orthoses, possibly. Um, if, if shockwave is, is not getting the results that we want. Um, and then you're into the, the realm of not being quite sure and, and hopefully you've got 80% of people sorted with that kind of approach. Um, and for the 20% who are, are not sorted, um, then you're looking at what we would call experimental approaches. And, and there you can go in any, any number of different directions. Yeah. And, and clearly there's some notable um, omissions in what I've just said. I haven't included um, steroid injection, but I would put that in the, um, in the sort of experimental approaches. It's not being shown against placebo not to be effective because as we talked earlier about the difficulty with placebos for, or, or shams for shockwave, um, most injection studies either compare to a low dose or an injection of something else or insertion of a needle, and we can't regard that as a true sham intervention because if you're sticking a needle in an injured, injured tissue or a problematic tissue, you're going to have an effect. So yeah, hopefully I haven't fudged the question too much of what we no, do. No, no. It's an aged package and, and shockwave quite early. Yeah. No, I think, I mean, that makes sense. And it goes back to what I said before about the standard problem with NEOA management. You know, you don't try one intervention, wait to see if it works or not, then try another, see if that works. Oh, no, let's try another. That's, that's what you don't do. <laughs> so, you know. yeah. And, and the, each of those interventions, I think, are addressing different things. That's the, yeah. the, the nice bit. So the shockwave probably affecting pain and affecting the tissue quite directly. Um, Orthosis probably a biomechanical thing. Footwear giving a mixture of biomechanics, shock absorption, uh, protection, education and load management are sort of a pain management approach. And uh, stretching again is a sort of local tissue thing. So hopefully they're complementary. Uh, we're not sort of <coughs> trying from one angle and then B from another angle aiming at the same thing. Sure. Okay, have you got any more in? No, nope, I've just been no. keeping an eye as you guys have been talking on the yeah. group and there doesn't seem to be anything else um, that we haven't covered already. So, no, well, I think so that's I the, think hour's, the hour's gone. So look, thanks so much, Dylan. It's been really good. I think I, I, I did a workshop last week and the question of shockwave therapy came up. So I said, watch PodChat Live this week. <laughs> um, so I think you've covered everything I think people want. So, so thanks very much, Dylan. Much appreciated. Yeah, thanks, Ian. Thank you, Thank sir. you both for organising, um, and I, I hope it's uh, useful for the, the sure. Okay. I'll